the German ambassador, Annette Gunther, the deputy ambassador to Israel, my friends and brothers, Francis Machuki, Khaled Ahmed, uh, Deepak Devedi, and um, I want to commend Orlando for the kind of strategic thinking he's put across for this particular very, very important initiative. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Siddharth Chatterjee, and normally what happens is when I have my first beer, I tend to mispronounce my name myself. <laughs> and believe me, on the second one, I forget it. <laughs> Back in 1965, the United States of America was in the midst of a war with Vietnam. There was a president called Lyndon Johnson. India, my country, was at the cusp of a famine. Close to a million people used to die a year, and that's the average. So what he did was he mobilized about 600 ships full of food and maize to be sent to India because India had a major shortfall. And what happened at that time was he said that we need to deal with the scourge of hunger and famine in India like we are fighting a war. And that's what the United States of America did. And they sent a mathematician by the name of Lester Brown. And this mathematician started looking at what is it that could be done to transform this. So he did the calculation, and that's what the calculations led to 600 ships of maize. But what it led to was the thinking that why not look at transforming this rather than keeping an entire nation state with such a massive population in a state of dependency. And that started what was termed as the Green Revolution. And the Green Revolution, the term came from the USAID administrator in 1968. And that is what started a transformative effect. So I was having a conversation with the governor of Homa Bay, Sipri Naviti, a dear friend of mine. And he was saying, oh, you know, Sid, we have these major problems in Suba sub-county, and you know, uh, you know, there's a lot of adolescent pregnancy, high levels of HIV, all kinds of problems. So I said, Mr. Governor, you know, what's the population of that county? He said 110,000. So I said, you know, Mr. Governor, with due apologies, 110,000 in my country is an extended family. But what I'm trying to say is that you, Kenya is at a wonderful place. And it is a wonderful place simply because it's not got to where populations have gone out of control. You're within control. But that's the reality. 3,000 Kenyans are born every day. So by the time you woke up this morning till the time you go to bed, 3,000 Kenyans were born. And this, the country's total fertility rate is, is at about four. But there are counties in Kenya where the total fertility rate is anywhere between six to eight. Total fertility rate meaning how many, uh, how many children will a woman produce during her lifetime. Which basically means that every year we have a million Kenyans being born, over a million Kenyans. Now let me put it into the context of what's happening in Africa, where the average total fertility rate is at about four. Every 24 hours, there are 33,000 young people looking for work in Kenya, in, the, in, the, in Africa, in the continent. And the reality is that Kenya has the largest number of young people that are jobless. Now, 10 to 12 million Africans join the workforce every year. Of that, barely about a million to two million jobs are being created. Essentially, this is going to be the pattern for the next 10 years. So Kenya needs a million jobs per year for the next 10 years in order to cater for this youth bulge. Have you wondered 
what is it that causes extremism? What is it that causes criminality of the, on the streets? What is it that causes a major disruption of law and order and instability? The number one driver of this is hunger, ladies and gentlemen. The United Nations Development Program conducted a study of, a, of the journey to violent extremism in Africa. The one, number one cause, whether it was in Somalia, whether it was in northeastern Kenya, whether it was in, in the Sahel region, anywhere, in India, the major driver was hunger. Unemployment, marginalization, increasing inequality, instability, high levels of illiteracy. But the tipping point have always been a point at which the government or state forces use the sledgehammer of violence. And what that does is it disrupts, you know, the death of a father, the death of a son, the death of a brother, the death of a mother. And that tipping point causes the person to fall to the blandishments of an extremist group. Now, this is a picture of technology and innovation to transform the entire agricultural landscape. They have lesser water than what is available in, in parts of Kenya. And they've just, cha they've just cha changed the entire dynamic by using the confluence of big data technology and, and, and innovation. Kenya has enormous, it's the hotbed of not just the best marathoners in the world, but it's got the most, most innovative society. The technological prowess that Kenya has is second to none. In fact, when you look at cashless transactions, Kenya is number two to Sweden globally. Now, this is the talent pool available in this country in terms of the kind of transformation that we are looking at. Why is our population growing so rapidly? Let me put that into some context, because it's important. Kenya had the same population as Sweden in 1956, seven million. Sweden today is 10.5 million, Kenya is 46 million. By 2030, Kenya will be 65 million. By 2050, Kenya will be 90 million. By 2050, Africa will be 2.3 billion. Now, this is important. When you look at Western Europe, or when you look at the Asian tigers, where their economies grew and flourished, some basic things they address. They address the issue of universal health coverage. They addressed issues of food security. They addressed issues of employment. They addressed issues of, of job creation and creating an opportunity where men and women joined the workforce. So what did that do? It improved household incomes. The microeconomic picture of the household improved. Better disposable income. Women were able to plan their family. As a result, better nourishment, better education, better opportunities for the younger generation. So what did it do? It created a whole group of young people that came into the workforce that was equipped, talented, and able to take the country to the next level. There are countries in Asia which were not Asian tigers, who had the same takeoff point. And it is because they invested in human capital. And most of all, most importantly, they invested in women joining the workforce. Ladies and gentlemen, Sub-Saharan Africa loses $95 billion annually because of women not being in the workforce, because of them being in a status of dependency, because of them not being part of a a correct workforce where they have the, exactly the employment opportunities that a man has. So these are issues that we need to collectively address because 
we have found through research that agriculture is the single most important avenue for getting people out of poverty. It's been proven in all of Africa. It's the single most important avenue in ensuring nation states start to progress. If you look at the Asian Tigers again, if you look at Western Europe again, all their takeoff points came from agriculture and food security. So I commend the president of Kenya when he decided on the Big Four agenda, because this is crucial given the demographic landscape of Africa, given the demographic landscape of Kenya. This is the reality. But look at the opportunity. When we talk about a $1 trillion business opportunity, this is not coming from SID. This is coming from the World Bank and the Africa Development Bank. That research is there. Now, Kenya can get ahead of the curve on that. Kenya potentially can become food surplus, and not just that, become the bed basket for the rest of Africa. Take a county like Turkana. Turkana has enough water, subterranean water, sitting underneath, which can cater to Kenya's fresh water supply for the next 70 years. How many of you knew that? The water is deep down. It has to be pulled up. We need, we need Norwegian companies which have oil rigs which can pull that water up, turn it into, uh, from saline to fresh water, open up irrigation channels, and we can actually have a northeastern counties uh, along the Somalia border and the Ethiopian border where we can actually look at food surplus counties and look at the entire value chain where, where you know, last year we were dealing with a major drought in Kenya. And that drought, repeated droughts, which have had an impact on the per capita GDP growth of this country. When I talked to, to you about India, there are places in India which have exactly the same challenges that Kenya has. But as a nation state with 1.3 billion people, people don't have issues of famine there. To me, Kenya is at the vanguard of change. It has the leadership. It has what I would term as the three Ps that fall in beautifully together. The political will, the right public policies, and what it needs is the orthodoxy of partnerships from the public sector to the private sector to governments and all that. Europe needs Africa in terms of its markets. That's exactly what happened with the United States post Second World War when the Marshall Plan was implemented in Europe. It opened up a, mar it opened up a market landscape and alliances which transformed Europe but transformed the American economy too. This is that moment where Europe needs to start looking at Africa as a market space, as an equal partner, not for aid, but to look at the model of aid and trade that can work together. To me, I have been quoted in several newspapers to say that I see Kenya as a beacon of hope. It is. It has the ability to have that transformative effect, to be able to drive that change. Its young population needs to embrace the reality that today, the average age of a Kenyan farmer is 61. The average age of a Kenyan is 18. How do you make that 18-year-old believe that, that farming is attractive? And that happens when in India, again, back in the 60s, the government started a call, a clarion call called Jai Jawan, Jai Kisan. And Jai Jawan meant salute to the soldier. But Jai Kisan meant salute to the farmer. So they equated the dignity of labor between a soldier and a farmer. So essentially, we need to have that dignity of labor given to a farmer, which basically means that a young person should be able to be, I mean, th there was a classic uh, film sent to me where um, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu was visiting Gujarat with Prime Minister Modi. And they're actually showing a drone which is overhead, uh, which the Israelis gave, and said that, you know, today with, with the exactitude, they can actually drop water onto a particular plant which needs just that right amount of water. I mean, it's like precision bombing, but you're using water to ensure that you, you grow your food crops. So we are not creating anything new. The technology is there. It's here in Kenya. 
what we need to do is embrace that change. What we need to do is tell our young people there is a potential, there's a dignity of labor, there's an opportunity for you to grow rich. Because the reality is that Kenya is at the cusp of a demographic dividend with a median age of 18. With a median age of 18, as the country starts to grow, by the time we come to 2050, we, the, media, the demographic dividend would have shifted. So if you look at Western Europe or you look at the Asian tigers, they've all aged. The median age of Sweden is 47, while the median age of Kenya is 18. But Sweden grew rich before it grew old, which is exactly what we need to be doing here, is getting rich before we grow old. And the opportunity that agriculture gives us is the fastest means of getting there.